welcome to our session on UDL for Accessible Learning Experiences. This session was organized by the LSA uh, Learning and Teaching Technology Consultants to give some of our faculty some helpful background and also some concrete hands-on examples from uh, your fellow faculty members. So, what is UDL? Um, one of the common tools that a lot of people have used in the past handful of years to get to grips with accessible design are the UDL guidelines. And first, of course, UDL is an acronym, Universal Design for Learning. And I do want to point out that the term universal is actually a topic of some dispute here. Um, from the start, it was more aspirational than actual. And the more we get hands-on, the more we realize how hard it is to meet all the needs of everyone because there will be conflicts, there will be unknowns, and that's really what we have to deal with. So a lot of UDL has started to focus more on being flexible enough to deal with the unforeseen. Uh, and of course, the term universal can also be a little misleading because this isn't about finding one universal solution that will fit everyone. On the contrary, it's about offering choices. Uh, UDL is a design framework that involves offering choices to learners in how they engage with us, choices in how they get information from us, and choices in how they demonstrate their knowledge and skills to us. So informing our learning design with UDL guidelines or similar frameworks uh, helps us to design courses that are flexible enough to meet the needs of diverse learners and that can be easily adjusted in the case of the unforeseen needs. And as people come in, please feel free to walk across me to get to chairs if you like. No barriers to access. The UDL framework was built initially on some neuroscience uh, with the understanding that no two people are going to learn exactly alike the framework did identify three neurological networks that contribute significantly to learning in many people. The framework encourages us to create flexible entry points for each of these three categories. So the basic UDL approach is to create multiple ways for learners to stay engaged, multiple ways for learners to get information, and multiple ways for learners to demonstrate their skills and knowledge. One example of this would be if you give a reflective assignment and accept it as written text, as spoken word, and as a concept map, right? That's, and that's a very small example, but also something that you can really build a lot on as you go and something that can flex to accommodate a lot of possibilities. To make the best use of something like the UDL guidelines and the other theories that you will hear about today, it helps to first identify what it is you want your students to learn. What should they know or be able to do by the end of your class or your lesson? The guidelines and the resources listed on the next slide um, will help you think about the likely range of variation in your students. And that will include things like neurodiversity, physical capabilities, language abilities, economic background, even their previous experience in the topic. Think especially about what will be involved and demanded by the material and the activities that you want to use. And at that point, you will be well situated to plan flexible options to get your students to the goal that you have in mind for them. We hope that today's speakers will give you some additional theory and some concrete examples to inspire you in this process. And the learning and teaching consultants are always available to help you with it, as are our uh, fellows at the LRC, several representatives of whom are here today. These are just a few resources to help you get started in the process. They are also listed in the handouts that will be given out uh, towards the end of the session. And again, we will be sharing the slides, so don't anybody feel you need to copy all of this down. The one I want to especially point out is the UDL Guidelines website. And this website, if you go up to the top and look for things like the engagement category, all right, I'll click on that. And here we have one of the first guidelines, recruiting interest. And if I scroll down, we have checkpoints with further information through each link, UDL guidelines, and frequently down here, you will also find additional resources. So this is just one item in this site. You can imagine when you get through all three categories how much material is here. 
it's a really good starting place for giving yourself a concrete uh, place to go and some really good recommendations, even if a lot of these specific examples are still geared more towards K-12 than towards higher ed. We're starting to get there with higher ed. If you ever need assistance or even just brainstorming help with accessible design, you can always contact the LSA Learning and Teaching Consultants or if you're in the languages, the Language Resource Center. We will always be glad to help and advise at any stage of this process. Okay, if you're attending remotely, what I'm doing is putting a speaker on myself right now. So that's part of the business with streaming. Uh, for those of you attending in person, you're not seeing the stream right now. This is actually how I teach, is in person to some students, and I teach uh, streamed. What I have, um, I'll be looking on my iPad later when I'm not talking, but right now I have it up on my phone to see what questions people have asked uh, during, uh, as, as I go through and talk. So I'll give you a, a way to do that coming up here. So uh, being in this, in this uh, presentation is actually kind of uh, interesting for me because prior to October, I would have never thought that universal design for learning or really accessibility is what I'm thinking about was what I did. Um, however, when I was at a conference for the American Statistical Association in October, uh, it's for the Women in Statistics and Data Science Conference, there was a session called Working and Thriving with Disability in the Statistical Sciences. And there, uh, the idea of, of universal design for learning got brought up and we had people, uh, the presenters had many different abilities in, in different aspects. And so when they shared their experiences and I mentioned it, all of a sudden it dawned on me of, oh, I, I am giving my students an, a, a way to access the material in a way that makes sense to them. And so I guess maybe it is accessible. So I figured out, oh, it is accessible and it is inclusive and it just kind of made sense to me, but I've also been doing it for uh, nine years. So it makes a lot of sense. What you're seeing at the bottom of the slide if you're attending in person or attending remotely is you see something that says text BC. So that BC for me stands for back channel. I always hope that nobody winds up copying my uh, way of, of setting up my polls because you can only use one keyword per. So the, I always say BC for back channel and then it's month and day. And that's what my students see at the bottom of every slide. Uh, on Wednesday when I was flying back from a, a workshop, they saw uh, apologies, but we don't have a back channel today because a colleague was teaching for me. Um, but uh, so if you're, attending, if you're attending in person, please do uh, actually just, you know, the old fashioned raise your hand works. Uh, but if you're attending remotely, you can text something in and then I'll see that come across. Um, so, okay. So a couple of things that I thought about when I was putting together this presentation, I thought, well, is it really just the fact that I give students choice about how to come to class? Is that really what makes the difference? And so I started thinking about how have I tried to make my learning accessible in terms of my entire career as an educator? And so one of the things that came to mind is, well, when I started teaching, I always thought of this idea of skeleton notes, which I don't think are a, a new technique to, to many folks. But this idea of having most of the notes written and then having the students write in uh, particular ideas, that that was something that I thought about. Uh, just remember, I have a whole slide on that, so I'll wait for that. An inclusivity statement that I've included beginning actually this term on my syllabus, and it's, uh, I'll share that with you, and I'm happy to share it by email as well. My, really for me, the hybrid flexible, so this high flex model that I use to teach, uh, I think is effective. Uh, using grade scope for uh, collecting homeworks and doing grading and then also some ideas for the future. So I actually, as a, as a, an edu as a learner, I'm much better with lecture or I'm actually pretty good because I took, so half, I have about two thirds of a PhD in statistics and two thirds of a PhD in education. And if you put two thirds and two thirds together, that makes one PhD. And so I actually, it was in some of my education classes that I learned, uh, um, about skeleton notes since I started applying those, but also I, I personally just learned better from, from hearing. But writing down wordy definitions, writing down examples, if I want to give a really good example, if to have a student write all of that down, just it never made sense to me. And so skeleton notes, I really feel, are, have been helpful for the students. They can write in what they need to know. It's another thing when I was looking up skeleton notes, because there are many, if you Google that, you'll find many different approaches. And you can use the approach that's good for you. Another thing that I realized in looking this up um, a couple weeks ago prepping for today is that you can actually have different types of scaffolding. So if somebody needed more than somebody else, you can offer that as well. 
Um, and so one of the things is we can pay attention to what's being said. It's hard to write down uh, ferociously when we, when we uh, learn. So I think that that's a good way to make things somewhat accessible to students. And also for those technical parts to be exact. It's, uh, there was many a theorem that I probably still in my notes am not sure that I have it down exactly, but that was what the person wrote and, and or I, it was my interpretation of what they wrote. So I find the skeleton notes to be helpful. Um, another thing, and again, I mentioned earlier that um, this is uh, an inclusivity statement, I think, is, a, is just telling students, hey, this is a place that you can come and you can be yourself and I'm going to respect you and your peers will respect you. you. And I'm not going to read the statement to you, but I actually the workshop that I was at, uh, Amelia McNamara was one of the instructors this week and I said, oh, I'm sharing your inclusivity statement this Friday. And she appreciated that uh, very much. But this idea of, I love the way she started though, with because data is collected by and about humans, uh, it necessarily then encodes aspects of our proclivity and biases. And so this is something that she came up with on her own that she's iterated through. And when I talked to her about it earlier this week, she said, yeah, actually I took a look at, we have a grant uh, for diversity and it's St. Thomas in Minnesota, not in anywhere exotic. Um, but uh, she said, yeah, we're looking at this about how I can make that even better. Um, so. So it's just a neat thing just to tell students, you know, again, I'm available for you and respect you as a human. Um, the big thing for me, I think what I bring to this uh, particular session that you're in, is that I teach with a hybrid flexible or high flex model of, of teaching and learning. And I debated, is it a model of teaching or is it a model of learning? It's the mode in which I teach, so thus I went with that. And so Brian Beatty, who's at San Francisco State University, he actually developed this hybrid flexible model. Um, for a lot of the reasons that, that I went with it. And so for me, the idea was, I did this actually at my previous school. Um, I needed to, uh, so I think what he had is, I had a very real need to serve both online and on ground students with a limited set of resources, time, faculty, and space. I was involved in a conversion from quarters to semesters. All of a sudden you had to teach 50% more students. And instead of offering the, it, three instead of two sections. My thought was just give me the two sections, but give me the ability to stream as well. So high flex, um, think about it as, and this is a great uh, quote that Brian has in uh, a book on high flex. I'll share that link with you, but it's a student directed hybrid learning experience. So uh, there's you know great things. Face to face courses are great. Online courses are great. Hybrid courses are great. Depends on what type of learner you are. This is one that allows the students to change on a daily basis. And so to me, it is this idea of being flexible. Uh, students can attend class in either in person or synchronously via stream. So some of you are attending this uh, particular session uh, synchronously streaming. And, and so this is actually the, the technology they use with me. Um, they can make that choice on a daily basis. And it's the student choice to me which really empowers the students. I, they can attend, so I have, I've had some people who have attended in person every day and then boom, they had to go to a conference and they were able to attend from that conference. Um, and so there's, it's just a great way to give students access to the materials. I also um, do allow recordings, uh, so I have lecture capture. Those recordings are up for approximately 48 hours and then I take them down, which is, so it's uh, labor intensive on my part to go in and take those down after they auto post. But I think that's good to keep students um, on pace with the material. I figured out for this term, so they have a choice of they can either be come on Monday or Tuesday, so for the first class of the week, so Monday or Tuesday, and then on Wednesday or Thursday. Uh, they can attend in person or remotely, and then, uh, so basically the way you did it, you, the students have 16 choices uh, in the course of a week, and which is kind of fun. Um, so ideally, the, the object here though is to give the students who are attending remotely an equivalent experience to those who are attending in person. And I'm very conscious of that where, I, so I just, uh, if you're attending remotely, you didn't see me just open up my phone again, but I thought I'm not actually monitoring the back channel, which makes me kind of ineffective at this moment. But fortunately, no questions have come in. Um, and so if you're attending remotely, you should be able to still ask the instructor or presenter a question and, um, and get this information synchronously. I, my guess is that this session is also being recorded so that folks could then watch it afterwards. It probably won't be taken down after 48 hours. Um, but for me, the two main aspects of HiveFlex are this, the lecture being streamed and then also the back channel. So um, for me, again, I, I think I've addressed this, um, that 
however you attend, you should be able to ask me questions as the instructor and me be able to engage with you. There is a bit of a lag. So one of the things my students have an option for is there is um, a reduced latency feed, which is about a 10 to 15 second lag, or there's a standard latency feed anywhere between 30 and 60 seconds. So depending on where they're attending, uh, if they've got a, a quick uh, internet access, reduced latency works very well. It's just a little bit of a difference so that I might be on the next slide of my presentation when I see a question come in, but I probably would have waited to be done with that slide to maybe answer that same question in class. So it's not really that big of a deal. Um, the big thing in terms of technology, and this is something I'm happy to work with anybody on, and, and we have fantastic folks in IT who can help you as well, um, is synchronously streaming the lecture. So for me, that means pretty much if you ever teach in a classroom that I've been in, there will be a streaming box in there because they just keep getting added. I think they've been added in other classrooms too, but uh, for a while they were coming in where I was. Um, and allowing this back channel. And so the back channel really does, I figure out where the mouse is. I don't know where the mouse is. Oh, there it is. I'm, there it is. Okay. I was looking on the screen. So the back channel, um, this is something that if you were attending remotely uh, and uh, put in polev.com slash drjbm, this would come up for you and is um, a way for you to, um, to ask a question or again, texting in. And then now I have to find where I am. Let's go back there. I think I won't pop on to the other one, which is monitoring, which is what I'm doing in terms of I'm looking at the session where questions might come in. I, when I started this off, I had a, a graduate student monitoring for me. Um, but I've been able to, to do it myself. I thought I would get very distracted because pretty much anything can, can distract me. If you've seen um, the movie where Squirrel is applicable, it, that's pretty much me. So, um, but I have learned to monitor the back channel and it's, it's fairly effective. I'd be happy to share with anyone. So, you know, why, so I, I actually had been doing this again at my previous university. When I first came here, I was teaching both Stats 250, which is the largest course in LSNA, um, and Stats 412. So Stats 250 is that intro stats course. Stats 412 is a probability, uh, calculus-based probability and statistics for basically for engineers and data scientists, but anyone's welcome. Uh, and so Stats 250, I found, didn't really need this. There were some really good uh, accessibility, uh, accessible opportunities for students built in. Some of the things that I did were, were have been used in 250. Mostly I've been using HyFlex and Stats 412 because I have a lot of students. So I teach 75% of my students, maybe 73, depends on what art tells me. But it's 75% of my students are in the College of Engineering. And so they're, they actually are up on North Campus, but I teach on Central Campus because that's where I'm housed. And so, as you know, 30 minutes to get from campus to campus is greater than the 10 minute path period we have. And so that doesn't really work for them. Uh, so this, and this is, they're not the only students who are helped out um, by the HyFlex model. So the streaming synchronously and remotely then will allow them to attend all their classes without missing anything. It's only an issue on exam days. That's the only day you have to be in my classroom is on an exam day. Uh, and again, I didn't want people attending remotely to, to miss out on interacting with me. And so um, the student impressions in terms of why this has actually worked, so why I think this is accessible for students, is that they really appreciated being able to attend in different ways. Um, what we saw was there's, usually there's just, here's my preferred method. We did have a student, when I first started doing this, maybe the second year that I was doing it and extended, and again, I was at a different school, uh, extended over to animal sciences, and there was one student who actually had the two classes on campus that were taught with a high flex model. And so that student would attend uh, one of my, uh, I don't remember if I had two or three lectures a week at that time, but one of them uh, in person and one remotely, and it had to do with when uh, the other class met. And so they were doing in person and remote for that as well. Um, Scheduling conflicts is sometimes, oh, I have a conference to go to, so I won't be able to attend in person. Uh, I've actually had athletes, uh, be it at events, and you know they couldn't attend in class, but they could attend in, in remotely, so that was great. Um, and also the communication, they appreciate that. Some, some good comments are, you know, they could, they could have hot chocolate in their PJs. Um, I don't know if I have this quote up here, but somebody was actually able to listen to uh, a lecture while in a car on the way to a wedding once. She was not driving, okay? 
Um, but uh, so it's it's just uh, just super nice. Uh, even the physical training for a student who's an ROTC, uh, this has helped that person and others as well. But you know there are some issues. So some people, you know, are, they're easily distracted on their computer. Yes, you know, it's 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 one of those things. But it, again, it's a choice, and that that power of choice. There have been some articles written on the power of of choice. Uh, that's very good. You know, occasionally, there are a couple of minor issues with the stream. For example, when we started today, if you don't have the uh, the microphone on, it's not going to go through the stream. And so that was just a little issue. So we got that fixed right away. Um, and so, you know, some of these, I think that there are always uh, always questions. I like the, I don't get to see the professor smile. They're making a lot of assumptions about me, but um, it, and it is hard. When I see them only in exams, that's difficult because I don't get their names and faces quite as well. Um, so there is actually a, t a textbook. So Brian Beatty, who coined the word high flex, there's a full book. That you'll actually see a full chapter on what happens here at uh, Michigan, which was written with my co-researcher. And you can always contact me and... Ah, some other things. So this is, I think this is what I was trying to, to add in. I, I had given Steven my, here are my slides, and then I think I meant to actually back these up. But some other accessibilities that I have for my students are they get their homework, uh, or they get, can get their homework through Canvas or through Gradescope. Gradescope is an online learning platform. It's used a lot in, um, on North Campus, primarily I think by uh, EECS. And so uh, that was introduced to me by some students. It's really nice because it's super slick. Students turn in PDFs of their homework or images of their homework. They assign, um, they assign questions to particular pages that they have, and then they're graded really nicely, very equally, and returned very safely. Same thing if you've never done exam scan and you return exams, best thing ever. Just look it up. Just do exam scan, UMish, LSA. It'll come up. It's fantastic. Um, you might be able to still get in for this winter. They just ran rosters now. Uh, Piazza is a way for my students to communicate with each other and then with me. I love letting the students have a, a chance to actually answer their own questions. And we do have that. That's uh, You can integrate, I think, Gradescope through Canvas and also Piazza through Canvas. But then in terms of thinking about this, of what are the other accessible things? So there are some accessibilities that I think I'm missing. An online office hours space. Um, I still haven't come up with that. Perhaps I should be talking to Emily at some point about online office hours. I just wasn't ready to onboard it this year yet. And then also something that came up when I was talking to the eCoach folks about potentially using eCoach in the fall, also a fantastic thing if you've uh, ever worked with those folks, is maybe having some flexible grading components. And so these are things I'm thinking of. I don't think my work's ever done. But hopefully the students find it to be accessible. Hopefully you see some ideas that you might like. And I will hand it off to Dr. Hagen. I'm not sure I can see everybody. I, I need to sit down when I uh, lecture. Um, but uh, welcome. And I uh, have been uh, here uh, for 50 years. Came in 1965, actually. And I got uh, interested in both cognitive psychology and developmental or child psychology uh, very early on. And I've worked in a lot of uh, different areas. And my uh, presentation, can everyone hear? Okay. My presentation is going to be more historical and more general uh, than the presentation uh, that we just uh, heard. But uh, let's, okay, let's do, go, go to the this one first. You are, have been hearing about the phrase universal design for learning, but it actually followed the notion of universal design. And universal design began in the 1960s at North Carolina State University in the School of Architecture. And I, I know you're all very familiar with the use of universal design. We have uh, curb cuts. Uh, elimination of stairs and uh, have ramps instead and all kinds of modifications in architecture and universal design for learning is sometimes called universal design for instruction especially in educational psychology and special education and i'm just going to mention a little about that uh, as i go on but uh, once upon a time, we designed stuff for the average person. 
So stairs are one of the main ways we have to um, go from one, one level to another, and stairs go back, of course, uh, hundreds if not thousands of years. And stairs obviously have real advantages. They can also pose problems, as this uh, gentleman who has a cane and kind of reminds me of myself, but we also have uh, the issue of people having to navigate a stairway carrying a stroller. And for this woman in a wheelchair, obviously the stair is impossible. Where is the child there? For the child, actually, some of you may know if you've studied child psychology that learning to climb stairs is a great developmental milestone. So the stairs are, are playing an important uh, role for that person. With universal design, we want to simplify life for everyone by making products, communications, and the built environment more usable by as many people as possible at little or no extra cost. And there are a lot of caveats in there. And uh, the uh, opening uh, remarks today talked about some issues about uh, what is truly universal and also what are the implications for cost and so forth. The Higher Education Opportunity Act um, provides access to uh, students and uh, employees, and the advancements include several provisions that uh, uh, address financial aid and that create new model demonstration programs. The act um, was enacted in August of 2008 that reauthorized parts of the Higher Ed Act going back to 1965. The phrase uh, cast is an important one, and we will give you that re uh, reference. But UDL is designed and a composition for the environment so it can be accessed, understood, and used by the greatest extent possible by all people, regardless of factors listed here, such as age, size, ability, or disability. It's not the same as accommodation. UDL is in addition to accommodation and it's a, uh, basically a proactive approach. Uh, CAST, uh, the website uh, is something you should explore and you can sign on there for free and access all kinds of uh, very good information. It was started by David Rose, many, I think it was back in the late 1980s at Harvard and uh, he is now retired, but uh, he has a, uh, an excellent crew that are uh, still using um, the, the site and developing new approaches. They started actually working with children with handicaps, but then extended to all different kind of uh, populations and situations. This uh, basically goes back to what you saw at the beginning and is incorporated in um, CAST, and we won't go into the details now, but the three general topics here, the engagement representation, and then the action, and then the actual way um, learners express what they have is kind of the cornerstone uh, for this work. So our challenge today, I think, is effective learning for diverse students in today's uh, educational environments. From the U.S. Department of Labor, we know that society has discrepancies amongst individuals regarding their learning characteristics, and for some, the gap continues to affect their lives as they move uh, into the world of work. Appropriate education may ameliorate some of the disparities experienced by individuals. However, educational institutions continue to struggle to provide ubiquitous access 
to curriculum and instruction uh, for students with disabilities. If you've been at Michigan for any uh, length of time, you know that we have a very good office for students with disabilities uh, in Haven Hall and they have incorporated all kinds of uh, information, materials, and uh, help with uh, uh, volunteers often to work with students. And uh, that program, actually I was on a committee that started it back, I think it was about 1987. And uh, Stuart Siegel, who was my doctoral student, was the director of it for 20 years and just recently retired and they're uh, searching for a new director for that program right now. But virtually all colleges and universities have some sort of unit like that and when we started that program, I think we had under 100 students, and now there are over 2,000 that are registered. I think the last two decades have been a time of real expansion, especially for post-secondary education. Again, as was alluded earlier, um, much of the uh, early work and universal design pertain to much younger uh, children uh, from the preschool um, and through uh, grade school and high school. So a lot of the work we're talking about now tends to be relatively newer and that's partly because of the federal uh, legislation. The um, Steelcase Learn Lab. Have any of you heard of the Steelcase Learn Lab? Well, I think it was in 19, I think it was in 2008, um, Bob Megatson, who was then the Associate Dean for Instruction in LSNA, and myself got uh, a grant from the Steelcase Company, which is in Grand Rapids. And you probably know that Steelcase uh, for many years was the largest manufacturer of office equipment. Like many uh, US companies, their um, market uh, was drying up because furniture was produced much cheaper in other countries. And Steelcase, uh, especially with a uh, very innovative uh, president, decided to start to um, expand into the area of learning and uh, classrooms and so forth. And there's a, a campus in Grand Rapids that has steel case uh, learning labs set up, but we are the first ones that set up this lab uh, in a Mosher Jordan dorm. And we got uh, permission from the dorms to set the classroom up. And it has uh, several things that are innovative about it. So there were three live screens specially designed tables and chairs on wheels, the huddle boards that you can see hanging on the walls that uh, can be moved from location to location or to different tables. And we also had a mounted camera, but after a group of students would work on a huddle board, could take a picture of it and then share it with the rest of the classroom. This is actually in the classroom uh, that first, uh, I think I taught there uh, five semesters, and then we also got uh, um, faculty from both math and English to teach in the, uh, the Learn Lab. And uh, the, um, st we could accommodate up to uh, 30 students. We had five tables with six chairs each, and this is uh, the way it would look at a, a given period of time. Let's go on to here, okay. This was really used as a pilot course using an observational scheme, including professors teaching behaviors, use of certain technology and students' attention levels. Uh, re the results found that learning could be collaborative, that students were able to identify with their groups. We had the students sit at the different tables, but we didn't form those for the whole semester. In fact, probably about every 
third or fourth class, we would move students around so some would stay at a table and others would come to that table. And they were all working on correlated assignments, uh, but they were developing things on their huddle boards and then sharing them uh, with the class. We also had a trained cadre of undergraduates who could record both what the professor was doing and what the students were paying attention to. And we worked out schemes. So we uh, did have a range of data. Uh, when the students were asked what they liked best about the classroom, uh, it always came out that they liked the uh, movable chairs, you know, which is kind of interesting. Another thing we learned just being very practical is we, find, we had to get um, Mosher Jordan to give us another room where they could put their coats and backpacks because it became very difficult in the winter term uh, for the students to get around easily with, you know, sim simple little things like that can make a huge difference. Okay. What do we mean by disabilities? And that is uh, an issue that uh, has come up in um, the United States, but also more recently by the World Health Organization. And they've actually come up with some definitions that I think uh, are somewhat broader and better than those that have been used in the uh, United States. So disability is viewed as an umbrella term covering impairments activity limitations, and participation restrictions. Within the United States, a lot of the terminology from the field of medicine has been applied to uh, handicap or disability, whereas the world approach has really moved away from that. So historically, the field of psychology and learning have um, ambiguities regarding where teaching ends and learning begins. If some students are beyond the margins of learning, they're often labeled as special education. And I won't go into that here other than to say that's still a hot and uh, divisive issue because just recently the new handbook of special education uh, came out that's very large and many, many chapters and hundreds of pages. And there are still people arguing that we still need special education and other people arguing that we don't really need it. If we're doing our teaching appropriately, we can get along without special education. UDL has provided a conceptual framework in which approaches to teaching and learning design have been developed to cater to students uh, from infancy uh, to secondary education and uh, now into adulthood as well. Hmm. Is Janice here? Where's Janice? Um, how much time do we have? We have five minutes. I'm going to let uh, Janice give a couple minutes of uh, her uh, work she's been doing. Uh, Janice uh, is an undergraduate who is from Detroit and has been especially interested in one application that I have worked in, which uh, has been with Head Start. Head Start is the largest federal program that the government has ever come up with in our country. It accommodates over a million children a year, and last year was its 55th anniversary. Yes, um, this past semester I did um, research with Dr. Hagen um, with regards to Head Start programs and um, the effectiveness of universal design and Head Start programs. So here I just listed some um, primary examples of ways that you can engage learners um, at this stage um, using universal design. Um, so here we just have some listed classroom games, toys, visual supports, technology, audio books, and imaginative play, um, which can be used to get um, learners' attention as well as keep them engaged. Okay. 
So why is universal design useful at the stage? It's really important to provide multiple means of representation, especially like at this age, because students are so young um, and very impressionable at this age to multiple forms of learning. So it's important to have play, um, multiple means of representation, such as reading and audio um, are also very important. And this method of UDL um, using within Head Start is also a very proactive foundation of learning. Um, whereas like, it, as opposed to using a reactive method, it's very proactive to really s provide the platform needed for students to succeed um, when they're learning. And yeah, it's also important for diverse communities as well. Here we have some um, longitudinal study findings that um, were found in the Perry Preschool Project, which is a local Head Start program um, research foundation. Um, and basically they did research studies around um, the effectiveness of Head Start and um, also UDL and how um, it really can like really benefit students long-term. So we just have some um, statistics shown here, shown here on the graph. So. Um, as you can see, like there are very immense differences between like the students that did attend Head Start programs versus those who didn't. Um, and it was really determined that uh, Head Start programs had a significant long term outcome, better long term outcome than those who didn't attend Head Start programs. Let, let me say a couple words. The reason I included this is that you may or may not know that the uh, Perry Preschool Project in Ypsilanti is really now world famous because it has shown gains 40 and 50 years later of children that attended this special uh, preschool program that was designed with what were the best and sound learning uh, principles and practices back in the 60s and early 70s. And there are actually two other national programs that have similar findings. So while the ends aren't huge, it does make a difference. And I've had several students here at U of M who are graduates of uh, the programs of either Head Start or very similar uh, programs, including Janice, okay? Uh, do you wanna devote just a minute or two to yours? I think we're very tight on okay. time. Um, so uh, this past semester, I did a more broad uh, sort of look at universal design for learning and what that really entails, because it's a sort of a term that we we hear a lot. And um, a lot of times it'll be associated to cast in very specific um, cut out how to guidelines to implement universal design for learning. Um, but also we can see that it came out of uh, a whole lot of history and it's founded on a lot of classical like psychological research and obviously um, some some very recent uh, turn of the century neuroscience as well um, and there's a whole bunch of these other uh, organizations that exist that sort of present the universal design uh, for learning principles um, sometimes presented as a uh, as the principles and sometimes sort of not mentioning the name of UDL so um, just uh, since we're out of time one other organization that I would just quickly point out to that is a uh, very interesting to look at is um, the IRIS. Uh, it's um, funded by the National Science uh, Institute, so um, it's specifically for the learning sciences, um, with the emphasis being on informal learning, social learning, um, and sort of like having a community base to your learning, which is um, to me indicated uh, a very good sort of uh, outlet to be going in uh, when it comes to making a truly universal design. Um, so that's just that uh, universal design is very broad. So there's a lot of places we could go with this. Uh, our next speaker is Dr. Melanie Ergo. She's an associate professor in English language and literature. Dr. Melanie will talk about accessible learning frameworks. Um, hi, so um, I'm Melanie Yurgo. Um, I have a few hard copies of um, outline and notes that I'm working from in case they would be helpful for following along, accessibility purposes. So I'll just hand these to Siva. 
Um, and I also just wanted to thank Siva for organizing all of us and, and Emily as, as well as um, well as um, John and uh, Jack and then Brennan and Janice for um, getting everything started. So um, just to kind of move forward a little bit here, um, I'm just going to start by giving a quick overview of what I'm hoping to share with you today. So um, my title slide here has an image of a protester holding a bright yellow sign that says nothing about us without us, um, which is one of the mottos of the disability rights movement. Um, and I'm hoping I can talk about what it means to design rhetorically or to crip composition. Um, and what I mean by this is I'm gonna talk about universal design, but kind of in a broader framework of accessible learning practices, um, in particular participatory design. So both thinking about how do we think about accessibility in the design of our classes, but also how do we think about accessibility with students so that what they're producing for us um, and for their peers is also accessible as well. So with that, I'll kind of move us forward here. Um, I wanted to just sort of position um, what we're talking about today also in the terms of critical accessibility. So first of all, um, you know, often when we talk about UDL and designing for disability more broadly, we often differentiate, at least in disability studies, between a social and a medical model of disability. So the social model holds that disability is created through interactions and environments, right? It's not necessarily the material or bodily reality of having an impairment or a condition, but how disability is socially constituted, right? So um, to go back to um, our previous presenters, stairs would be an example of how disability is socially created. Um, because if you know, the stairs weren't there, disability wouldn't come into contact in the same way. Um, but also, right, like if we're thinking about critical accessibility and the social model, then the way we approach access or universal design isn't based on a premise of charity, fixing, or helping people, right? So UD UDL isn't about kindliness toward the other, but it's rather a radical project of trying to reinvent these spaces that we're, we're constantly in in the academy to be more inclusive. Um, and then finally, down here at the bottom of the slide, um, I have two bullet points that I'm hoping we can focus on the most here in our conversation. So one is how our design practices enable full and equitable participation, right? So that we're not just users or consumers of a space, but we're thinking about how students um, can also be active um, co-leaders and co-creators in how we're designing a space. Um, and on the side here, I have an image of a brightly lit light bulb that I call the migraine light bulb. Um, and so it's also a little bit darker toward the edges, right? But um, I, I have this image of a light bulb because part of thinking about critical accessibility and, and universal and participatory design is also to think about access conflicts. So one access conflict that I love to bring up is lighting because lighting um, enables people to access with visual materials, right? So um, we can think about um, low vision folks, um, folks who need large print. Um, light facilitates how we engage with stuff, but then if we think about seizures, if we think about migraines, if we think about sensory differences, suddenly lighting is really terrible. So how do we then deal with something, right, when we're in a space where there's one light switch like this and it's a bunch of fluorescents? Some people need the fluorescents, others really need to get away from them. So Hopefully our, our conversations can direct us here as well. So I've been using a few different terms. Um, I've been using universal design, which my co-panelists have really done a lovely job of explaining and positioning. Um, but I've also been using the term participatory design. So I thought it might be helpful to sort of show where the overlaps, but also some of the dissonances are with these two theories. So um, as folks have mentioned, universal design really does involve designing for the widest array of users possible, right? So it's trying to conceptualize as many people as we can as we're trying to create a space, create an assignment, et cetera. Participatory design um, has some relics of universal design, just like UD has you know, some resonances with participation, but where participatory design draws our attention is trying to involve users, right? And not just seeing users as people, again, who are consumers of a product, an assignment, et cetera, but as active co-agents and co-designers um, in the thing itself. On the side here, um, there's this kind of classic accessibility sign that you might see on, on you know, academic buildings. This one comes from EMU because I live near EMU. Um, it has the iconic wheelchair user logo, 
um, positioned right above some something some text that says use rear entrance um, and I'm forgetting which building it was but I kept going from entrance to entrance and kept seeing the same sign until I got halfway around the building and finally found what constituted the rear entrance um, but there's something about this that doesn't necessarily signal participation even though that's its main intent so I gave um, the icon a donut. Um, I just sort of photoshopped the donut onto the logo um, on the sign. So coming back to universal design, and I'm, I'm going to talk about a few different principles of UD and UDL, um, and then draw these back to the question of participation. So um, as um, uh, John had mentioned um, North Carolina State was really the birthplace in a lot of ways of theories about UD, um, Ron Mace in particular. And if you actually go to NC State's Center for Universal Design website, you'll find quite a few resources, um, including a great deal of explanation, examples, and also source materials around seven different principles of, of UD. I'm going to focus on three of them because I, I feel like for me as an instructor and as someone who has continually learned from my students and colleagues, these three are the principles that manifest themselves again and again in teaching. So one is equitability, the other is flexibility, and the other is simplicity. Um, and I wanna note that um, as others have said, right, UD is about trying to conceptualize design from its very beginning, right? Really thinking intently about an audience's needs rather than retrofitting after the fact. Um, and so the image here is an example of retrofitting. This is also from EMU. It's disability graffiti that I found. Um, one building, it was a dorm, literally had a ramp to nowhere. It ended at stairs. So somebody had drawn on the cement. Um, first, uh, a wheelchair user um, stuck behind what looks like to be a wave or steps or something. And then right next to it, a drawing of a middle finger extended um, at the stairs. So I'll start with um, you know, one of the first principles I mentioned, equitability. Um, and so what this essentially means is creating equivalent experiences, right? So providing the same means of use or access for everyone. Um, and another way of thinking about this is avoiding segregatory design. Um, so a prime example might be special education as a form of segregatory design in, in educational spaces, right? We are literally separating disabled students from non-disabled students. Another example of this would be even entryways into buildings. Um, how do we get into this very room, right? Like what pathways are available to some bodies and not to others? This particular image to me is a really striking example. It came from a rest stop parking lot um, where the um, accessibility parking spaces all had giant signs underneath them that said no dogs allowed. And Granted, I'm sure service animals would be an exception to this, but there was just this weird ableist implication of sticking those signs right next to each other. So it was very quickly um, a recognition, right, that these spaces are meant for, even putatively, that they're meant for folks who ha might have disabilities. They're meant for some bodies and not for others. So flexibility would be another principle um, that I think would be particularly important for our own work. Um, and flexibility is really about providing choice and how people access a space or a product, right? So it's not just thinking about equivalency in terms of pathways, but also recognizing that we all need different things at different times, right? So in that way, it's not just about how different people access a space or come to an assignment, but how they might come to it at different points um, in time or in relationship to their own health. Um, this also means trying to create spaces in which accommodations are a natural part of those spaces. And I, I kind of want to give a sense of what I mean here. Um, so accommodations are a part of any kind of disability landscape, and I would argue any part of human landscape. So this also involves being attentive to how we're positioned in space. Um, if we're thinking about a classroom context, for instance, I am describing the images on my slide. Um, so this is about not making assumptions about how we're coming to a, a given text or a given exchange or conversation, but really, again, trying to provide mechanisms so that people can access through different pathways. Um, the image that I have here is an example of, a, of an inflexible space, and um, it comes from an academic conference, which I think um, conferences are some of the most inaccessible, inflexible spaces that we might encounter in an academic setting. Um, this is from my own field, the four C's, which stands for the Conference on College Composition and Communication. 
And at last year's convention, they had this giant, giant banner that says the four C's is accessible. It was not accessible. So basically, attendees started decorating the sign with post-it notes for all the reasons and why it was not accessible. And I'll, I'll read a couple of, of them here. Um, the, the image is particularly blurry around the post-its. But one um, says that there must be microphones for questions, right? So um, thinking about how we have conversations and how we're reliant or we choose to ignore the technologies available to us in the room. Another um, bemoans the lack of access copies, and especially in the humanities. Um, conference presentations are typically scripted, so somebody reading jargon from a page and not having an access copy really means that many people cannot be present or co-participants in that space. And then finally, the third principle I wanted to touch on is simplicity, which I think is particularly important because often um, in, in academe, we have this weird notion that in order to be rigorous, we need to be as complicated as possible. And often, like we take on the worst possible advice for trying to actually communicate with other humans. Um, and so I, I really wanted to hammer down on this, in part because one of the major conversations in disability studies as an academic field right now is around cognitively accessible language. So not just how we're thinking about our relationships with our students, but our relationships with our colleagues and other people in the field. So how is it that we're explaining concepts to people? Um, what are the texts we're assigning and what opportunities do we have to engage with students in some of this close reading, but also breaking down the complexity of terms? So in addition to reducing complexity, part of this is being clear and consistent. This could be in the design of our syllabi or assignments, right? streamlining materials. It's also about designing a space that welcomes a wide range of languages and literacies. So this also means meeting students where they are, but also recognizing that what they have to bring into a course conversation is going to be providing a valuable perspective, regardless of whether or not they are talking in the language of the discipline. So here's where I'm hoping we might have a couple of minutes to engage in a quick exercise together. And this is where I'm also going to kind of draw this back to the question of participation and trying not to make assumptions, but also trying to think about how we approach access conflicts when we're um, developing any kind of exercise or assignment. So um, I'm going to show an image in a moment. And what I'd like you to do is to find a partner. And if you're at a weird table configuration, it's OK if you have like more than one partner. But more or less, if you have a group or a partner, one person is going to play the role of describer, and the other is going to play the role of user or receiver or listener. You can use whichever term um, you'd like to use. So the describer is going to take a look at this image and try to exhaustively describe what's happening. And the person who's playing the role of user is going to try and offer some feedback. Right? It could be based on the user's looking at the image, or the user could choose not to look at the image and just see if this description is really making any sense to them based on no visual information. So I'm going to show this image. I'm not going to describe it. I'd like you to go ahead and take a couple of minutes to try and describe and listen. And then we'll talk a bit more about context. So here is the image. Yeah, 
So I'm just going to give a one minute warning. I'll just take it for from two or three people. All right, I'm going to interrupt. I know that these are in-depth conversations, um, but for the sake of time, I want to make sure we hear from maybe two or three people. So as briefly as you can, um, I'd like to hear from a couple of different groups, either from the describer or the receiver slash user roles in terms of the approach you took, but also what the substance of your description was. I'd say that um, Jaron's description at first was kind of abstract and really philosophical. And I, I kind of had glanced at the image and it wasn't until he got into the details. And I think like he described the, the stress around the eyes and he thought it was a disgruntled look. And, and he was, um, when he was describing that, that really helped me understand, like the more detailed he got about that picture, it was more helpful. And so I'm just going to revoice for the benefit of folks who are streaming. So um, basically, the describer in the group was very abstract and philosophical at first. Mm -hmm. And then through the course of the conversation, um, things turned more toward the concrete, like literal um, material aspects of the person's face in the image. One more group. I'm curious if we could have one more group share where they went. It's funny that um, we both both at the end, which it would have been better if one of us not. But we went through the description and then the conversations sort of evolved. And I mentioned, oh, it's obvious who this is. And Joe Biden. I said, I thought it was a pub. So, family, 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 Interesting. So just to kind of revoice, so the way that the conversation went was to try to identify the person or a quick recognition that maybe this was Joe Biden. And I didn't quite hear if there was someone else. I said this is a Caucasian. Caucasian. Yeah. And then we sort of felt finished with the exercise. Yes. And then we were, I don't know how, anyway, he said, well, it's obviously Joe Biden looking at it. And I'm like, oh, that's not who I thought it was. Mm -hmm. Wow. So, so this like, but this is really interesting, right? And like, just based on like the two groups that we've heard from, we've got totally different representations of this image. And so um, one reason why I wanted us to do this collective exercise is one, um, taking the time to actually describe our materials to students and where we're coming from as an access measure. But what happens when students are creating materials for us, for each other, for broader publics, and not engaging in these same practices? So how do we then draw people's attention to thinking about the different purposes for description, how to locate context, and things that actually are quite challenging just beyond saying like uh, a older white man with eyes. Um, so just to, uh, by, uh, by way of humorous ending, here are some responses. This actually comes from Simon Baron Cohen's reading the um, mind and the eyes test. It's a really well critiqued test because it's often used to try and diagnose autism, especially in adults. And um, these images come from celebrities that they, they've cropped. Um, so me and a few friends tried humorously approaching it. And I had said, I don't always stare longingly into the distance. But when I do, it's for manly things like science or hamburgers with donuts for buns. Um, Danny said, you remind me of my dog I had when I was a boy. He was a good dog. Emma says, my name is Captain Cowboy Marlboro, Marlboro Man Hemingway. 
but most people just call me Dick. And then Ibby says, crunch, gold darn it. That's the third pair of sunglasses I sat on this month. The answer from the test is the spondent. And this is what it's supposed to convey. So again, this range of responses, but it comes back to this question of creating access and also thinking about how we work collectively together. Thank you. You know, I have no idea, but now I think it is. <laughs> yes, so the question was, is this actually Joe Biden? And my response was, I don't know, but now I want to find out. All right, so thank you very much to all of our presenters. And uh, we also have some handouts coming around right now. And these also included uh, some of the reference uh, resources from the beginning of the presentation. I'm going to quickly flip through the last few slides. I'm so glad, I'm so sad that we didn't get to spoon theory. I love spoon theory. So last point, uh, and now we have questions. And now here's where I get to run around the room madly. Um, ferrying the microphone back and forth to people who have questions, and then to our presenters. So does anybody have questions for our panelists? Oh, wonderful. We have a remote question. So the question that came up remotely earlier, and I apologize to the person that came up after I had sat down, but uh, it was a question to me of, do you keep track of who attends remotely and who attends in class? If so, how do I go about that? And so, uh, no, I don't. I think you could do that if you had some sort of um, something like an, an, an iClick or Cloud type of accounts so that you were doing something, but then you would have to have geolocation off, which is problematic. Uh, you can ask me another time about that from last term. Um, but uh, that's something I had asked Emily earlier, of, will we know how many people are attending remotely? And the answer is we don't know until we look at the numbers later. So I think that's something that it, at some point maybe we'll be able to devise something uh, for that. For me, it's, you know, students have a choice to attend or not. So I guess that's another aspect. Uh, and so uh, it's, in the f it's in the future ideas, but thanks for asking that. Other questions? Uh, my question is for Dr. Miller. Um, how long did it take you to adjust to teaching in this manner? Because you've got a lot going on. And it, for someone to just jump in cold, I could see it being very overwhelming. Um, so if you could talk about, I'm assuming you just did one thing at a time and habituated to it, but there's people also who are not comfortable with technology or the, the multiple things happening. So just, I want to hear your your experience about that. And then at what point you felt comfortable enough to start, I think at one point you said you had tech support in the room and I'm assuming you have less now. So just that timeline. So um, for me, and please call me Jack, it's a, uh, but, uh, so the first time I did this, I had, I had the fortunate part of I was on a, so if I think back, I have to think back to quarters. And so when we were on quarters, the first time I had a graduate student who was in the room, I wouldn't even be looking at the back channel. Um, and, and that graduate student would respond. So we also had a, we had a better way of allowing students to see the conversation because I use Poll Everywhere right now. And at that time, Poll Everywhere gave me a static URL where I could always see the, what was being asked on my channel. So my grad student could watch that and then, um, and then respond. And so sometimes he would just respond if it was like a quick question. Otherwise, he would raise his hand and, and ask me, which is what I'm trying to do for us for, to get folks remotely involved. Um, so I'd say for one term, we did it that way. He was with me the entire year for that year because he was my research assistant, so I was very fortunate. Um, and we phased him out at some point, so by the third the, by the third quarter of doing it, I was comfortable enough to watch the uh, to watch the back channel myself, and it's just something I've had to get used to because, as I mentioned during the presentation, I am very distractible. So squirrel happens, and I'm I'm gone, uh, and so I I have to just be very deliberate. But it's it's I've trained it in myself. Uh, we actually did it. 
uh, there were, there was about a week where uh, we had my grad student. He he did the teaching for a week, and I did the back channel. So it was kind of a neat thing. I I would say for anyone getting into it, it's if there would be somebody even who could come in hourly, you know, an hourly paid person to come in and just monitor the back channel. Uh, and it's just a getting used to it. Some people may never get used to it and might always have a back channel monitor, and I think that's fine if there's a low cost way to do it. Other people like myself, it was like, nah, eh, I'll try it myself, and it, it works, you know, pretty well. Thanks for asking. Did I answer all your questions? Okay, cool. I really like the opportunity for students to be able to F2F or virtual. How do you handle stu the lessons that where they have to work together um, and you've planned for uh, a certain number of pairs or small groups? and you really don't know how many you'll have. Um, how do you avoid that? Because I really want to try what you're doing. So uh, thanks for asking that. The question is, is how do I, how do I handle um, students working together? So I've, this is something, I, I hate to say this, I don't, uh, is the answer. So right now, one of the things, so I had some students working with me last term on trying to get more activity into the class, and so something that I would like to do would be, I usually like to do something like a quick think pair share so students can think about it, but if you're attending remotely, you might be by yourself, and so then you can think, you could probably share with yourself, if, or you know, or think, you could pair with yourself with a mirror and then share, so that's not really effective. Um, trying to figure out good ways to, uh, to get data, so if I have my students do some uh, participatory uh, generation of data, is that something that I could use, say, at Google Doc to get that data in? Uh, so right now, I, I think I do it by avoiding, it, it's, I, I, by avoiding, yeah. Uh, but I, I, I'm also teaching, it's a 400 level course to about, you know, almost three quarters engineers, so they're typically used to just a regular typical lecture. Uh, but when I was offered a classroom space in the, the one of the new classroom buildings, it's like, oh, that'd be fantastic, but not for this class. And so, uh, so I turned it down. So I think that's something in the future. But it's some, you know, it's, if anybody has questions, I'd love to figure out ways to do that. I think it'd be a good way to expand. We'll, we'll do. Um, yeah. So I have a question. Um, just regarding, I guess, the exercise that we did in terms of describing the um, photograph, uh, one thing that kind of came up in our group, I was the one who was describing initially, and I actually left out reference to the race and gender of the um, person depicted. Um, if I had had more time, I might have said something like the person has like ivory skin and um, masculine looking features. Um, but it seems like there were a lot of, I guess, assumptions about the race and gender of the person, which actually were really important for the interpretation of what was going on. Um, and so I guess uh, just even thinking back to the earlier um, presentation about like our biases and our proclivities. And so um, just sort of wondering, you know, wh what we sort of make of the fact that one part of accessibility may be sort of providing these kinds of descriptions. And then what happens when we're in a position of having to sort of um, make assumptions about what's going on and then how do we sort of indicate that those are uh, our um, assumptions and our perceptions about what's going on without actually sort of like imposing it on the um, image and when is it okay to do that and when is it problematic? I think this case was a little bit more obvious but there might be some um, cases where it might actually be an issue of accessibility what we are projecting um, on the image. So I'm just curious to hear thoughts about that since that came up in our group. Thank you. That is a really excellent question. Um, and it's a really challenging question um, for a lot of the reasons that you mentioned. So part of this also, I think, depends on the contextual information we have available to us and also the purpose for which we are describing an image. Um, so if we're thinking about an online context, for example, and developing alt text, often the impulse there is to give really short, brief descriptions. So even just a person staring into the sun, although we still don't even know if this person was staring into the sun in this image, right, might be sufficient. But um, in, in other contexts, especially depending on how we're in, envisioning users will engage with the image, then um, questions of race and gender become more material, um, as do things like bodily comportment, um, background information, um, scenery, right? So all those things get enwrapped there. Um, the reason why you, 
what you say is also super important is a lot of these image descriptions are becoming more automated and AI is particularly racist and sexist in how it interprets images. Um, so this is one reason why Facebook's AI in particular is uses a minimalist approach. So if you ever, if you use Facebook and if you have the opportunity, after you've uploaded an image, you can actually go in and see what the alt text is that has been generated for your image. So I would recommend trying this out, but it's also, I mean, this is connected to um, Google search, for example, um, image search has some really racist legacies associated with its AI for image recognition. Um, so there's this also like conjoined history in a sense between that and accessibility because on one level, um, AI enhances access, but on another level, it also reinforces biases. Um, to get back to your question in terms of what people were doing here, um, so we have access to some information once we've gotten the context, what the race and gender of the person in the image is, even though we don't know the answer to whether or not this is Joe Biden or, or somebody else. Um, but the fact that we didn't beforehand, right, raises all of the questions that you offered. Um, how quickly are we going to go to's and what we're visually interpreting and describing? What's the role of the person describing, right? So at what point is this a description versus an interpretation? So um, I think where I just kind of want to end there, I realize that in some ways I'm not answering your question and just raising more problems, but coming back to use and purpose, I, I think is how we negotiate these things, but it's also why it's important we talk with students about it too. Actually, I'm, I'm going to jump in here just a little bit in terms of classroom practice, because that is something that I have run into before when I'm assisting faculty, especially faculty who are working in, for example, film criticism or you know advertising classes where it's, it's vital that they talk about the emotional weighting of the image for different groups and different audiences. And what really, really worked well there was not to appeal to a single source, for example, Google's image recognition, algorithm, but rather to appeal to the learning community itself, to the class itself, and to say, okay, if you were describing the, the import, the weighting of this image for a non-sighted person or one of your classmates, what would you say? And to gather 5, 10, 15 different descriptions, and then not only do you have an extremely rich description, but you have a very teachable moment of what are people seeing in this, and what, what does their perspective add to their interpretation. So, you know, yes, it's extremely naughty, but that can also be a really great opportunity if you want to take the class time for it. Next question. I forgot to bring the question. Oh, I can remember. Is this on? Yep. Oh, okay. Um, two things. There is an accessibility librarian here who worked on a project with the Crest Foundation to come up with guidance for better alt text descriptions for art books, for like scholarship in the art. So you're talking about things that are intrinsically visual for people who perhaps can't see. And um, it's the Crest Foundation and it, it's quite good. So it, I, I feel like it helps well beyond art and art history. Um, the other, one of the, my question was, one of you had shown a slide with like three columns of, of different way of engagement Okay, um, would you discuss that with, stu like would you des design your class around those elements and those activities or would you actually, I mean it could turn into a mess, but could it, can you think of ways to actually engage the students in helping to think about how you do those things in a classroom? Maybe it depends on the level. guidelines so that was there's like a several um, versions of the UDL guidelines but that was one of them um, designed as columns um, so I think different people would definitely answer that question very differently um, <laughs> but uh, but I would I would um, of course uh, coming from like researching the community aspects of it and how um, interwoven is the community within the classroom, specifically within the classroom. Um, I think that would change it, um, sort of having the open uh, methods of being able to ask questions. Um, students at any time and feeling comfortable doing that and sort of continually 
updating your theory of what a successful learning environment looks like. Um, there's um, certain models uh, that exist right now that sort of connect um, ongoing research from within the classroom um, with like making new policies, um, sort of like having databases that like people who um, are educators or are uh, interested in uh, learning design can all like sort of look at these things continuously as we are consistently updating it. So I think a lot of that would like realistically um, bring in like sort of student experience more and more. Um, so it, it sort of all integrates in this broad sort of interconnecting way. Um, and there's a whole lot of different models to show this to help us better understand specific things. So I don't know if anybody else has anything else, um, a different way to answer that question. I think it's more than like say something about anticipatory mocking. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I think I might need to th think about that. And actually, could you repeat part of your question again? I, I know you had started with the art books, but um, the art books, okay. Um, so when I look, when I, when I look at a, 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 a guide or a chart like that that has features that are really, in a sense, about pedagogy, it shouldn't matter, well, it might matter whether it's a math class or an engineering class or I teach intellectual property at the iSchool. How you structure whatever the content is that you're supposed to be delivering and engaging about should in some way be amenable to those kind of higher level pedagogical ideas. And um, it's sort of like, would you, would you, do, you, do you hide the, the ball or do you not hide the ball? Do you say, this is what I'm trying, we're trying to talk about copyright, but here's, here's how we're trying to think about it in terms of our conversation um, and be somewhat iterative, which works if you have a smaller class, but not in a huge class, at least, well, maybe it could, I don't know. Um, the question is, especially with, I was gonna say, especially graduate students, but you guys are undergraduates and you're kind of making me think. Um, do you, is there, oh, is there any experience with taking those pedagogical concepts and actually making them part of, the, in the same way we think about diversity broadly or anything else, you bring in examples or context into whatever the subject is to both be improving your delivery of teaching, but also that's a piece of their education. No, but I think, thank you, that was helpful. No, um, because I, I think like, so to, to focus maybe on the question of examples, I mean, I, I think in some ways, like if we're tying it back to UDL, like it could fall under simplicity. It could also fall under flexibility, right? Like this idea of creating choice in the sense that by hitting on different examples and thinking about different ways to explain or represent a concept that's at work, you have a higher likelihood of engaging more people in the room, but also giving them possibilities to become participants in their own learning, right? Like to connect it to examples that might be more meaningful for them and so on. Um, so I don't know if that kind of, it start, okay. So from a game design perspective, when people tell you the rules of a game, that will engage you more. And so telling people what the metaphor is about or showing them those three charts, I think is similar to the game design principle of like, you don't lessen the power of the metaphor when you tell people what the game is about. So I would say including it is another way of doing it. Haven't tested it, but it works in game design. So it's kind of like just piggybacking off, off of that. It's like learning objectives, using Bloom's taxonomy, higher order thinking, there's examples, there's a ton of graphs. I just brought one up on like creative thinking and what, what are the descriptors there and making that available to students so they know what the goals are. So we're almost out of time with the room. Uh, does anybody have any last minute questions? Any last minute questions before we wrap up? Just a very quick one for you folks. How much do you see that 
the new approaches to teaching are really being um, utilized now. I know 10 or 11 years ago when we were first teaching our class, we had the students go into places like Mason Hall and Angel, look in the window and write down what was happening. And about 80% was somebody standing at a blackboard and people sitting there. How, how much has that changed, do you think? And obviously, you know, we don't see all the teaching that's happening, but I do think that there is a steady progress um, or at least a steady process being made, not least because this is starting to inform a lot of the decisions, the structural decisions about what furniture gets bought. So when you talked about steel case classroom, it was like, yes, we're doing it, we're doing it right, woohoo! Because now in Mason, there are a lot of rooms that have movable furniture, mobile chairs, team tables, writing surfaces on the walls, and that is very much something that we encourage faculty to think about, to request if they want it, and increasingly, we also have the high-tech versions of this available for people who want to do the really daring things. And that, on the, you know, it's, it's the constant three-legged race. On the one hand, that opens access for many, and at the same time, it has access barriers for others, uh, as Melanie was speaking of. So I do think that these ideas are steadily percolating out into our instructional process. Does anybody else want to add to that? I, just to a, I was just listening to a TED talk recently about like inclusive classroom design and where there's a lot of kind of teamwork built in like the team arrangement of um, chairs and spaces and that doesn't really lend well to introverts. So there, it's, so it's good to have other channels like a back channel and other ways that introverts can participate and not feel bogged and, intrus and intru intrusive. Um, or intrused in, I <laughs> can't think of the word. <laughs> but um, yeah, so there, there's, there's, there, there's that other element like collaboration overload. Um, I just wanted to add that. Absolutely, I endorse this as a lifetime introvert. <laughs> so yes, you know, and as we've seen in today's session, there are a lot of extremely diverse ideas about how we could go about this in individual classrooms and Let's see if I can actually bring up our contact information or whether this is locked. Let's see. Nope, Siba would need to log in again. Anyway, if you would like to talk to someone about this as you're you know, putting together your next class, please feel free to contact LTC, the Learning and Teaching Consultants. Thank you, thank you. Next slide. One forward, there we go. Um, we are here for one-on-one -on -one consultations with any uh, member of the LSA faculty. You can phone us, you can email us, you can drop in at our office, whatever you like. For language faculty, of course, our associates at uh, the Learning Resource Center are over in the North Quad building, and they are equally happy, uh, as you can see, because several of them are here, to also pitch in with this. And you know, even if you want to just brainstorm ideas, or if you want to drop in and say, so, okay, I think I got the basic idea, help me find some better research. We can help you with that too. All right. Any last minute questions, thoughts, comments? No? Thank you also. Thank you for coming. <laughs>